Luke, welcome to Transfer Talk. A lot has happened since Good Morning Transfers. We'll have the latest on Tottenham's attempts to sign a striker. There's Ole Gunnar Solskjaer on fresh reports linking Bruno Fernandes with the club too. Don't forget, you can tweet the show at Sky Sports News. Hashtag Transfer Talk. We're going to get to some developments at Manchester United shortly, but we're going to start with Tottenham. And after Jose Mourinho was adamant that they wouldn't be active in this window, injuries have changed that. We've spoken about their need to replace Musa Sissoko because he's injured. But now, with Harry Kane out too, they're looking for a striker. Michael, who is it? Yes, Tottenham and Milan are in talks with Chris, uh, on the play of Christian Piontek. Uh, moving to London this month. Uh, they're in not in an advanced stage and no formal offers have yet been made for the Polish striker. It's unclear at this point whether the move will be permanent or a loan deal. So that might be something that the two clubs are talking about at the moment, but there are talks, the club are holding talks, Tottenham Hotspur and AC Milan and Tottenham or, I mean, obviously, need a new striker after Harry Kane's injury. OK, Anton, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you to tell us more about Piontek, but uh, first of all, we can't ignore that. Is that what happens when you ask a, a bad question to a manager in a news conference? Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah no, <laughs> Nuno gets rough. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a yoga injury, which is even worse. Oh, it's good so, to have you back. It's yeah. good to have how, you back. How, 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 <laughs> how does that happen in yoga? I was doing a... <laughs> I was, going into, I was going into, I can't believe I'm doing this on air, thanks guys. I was doing, I was doing a back bend and went overextended and just felt a <laughs> right there. So I kind of got ruptured two muscles, one there, one there. So, so but you yeah. are okay though? I'm, I'm clearly. Panic over, yeah. panic they over, say, right. They say, they say can you do tomorrow, but he's not very flexible. Ah, uh, good one, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, tell us How more. dead jokes <laughs> oh, no, I know. <laughs> tell, This is appalling. <laughs> tell us more about Piontech. Piontech, yes. Uh, what Spurs signing? Spurs are signing, they're signing a finisher. Effectively, he's not going to offer too much in the build up play. He's going to hang around the box. His passing can be better, but he will, if Spurs are playing well, get you goals. Well, I say that this season's version of Piontek has been struggling as Milan have been struggling. Like his record this season hasn't been particularly fantastic. He's scored four goals so far this season in 14 starts. So that's why Milan have made him the sacrificial lamb as they try and deal with their financial problems and because they obviously wanted to go out and sign Zlatan Ibrahimovic. But if you sign the player from last season, you're getting an absolute star. He blazed onto the scene, scored 13 goals and 18 starts at Genoa before getting his 36 million euro move to Milan this time last year, where he went on to score another nine. So which kind of player they're getting, I don't know. But if Spurs are playing well, he will score goals. All right, Ade, let's say he does sign. Yeah. Of course, they'll be replacing Harry Kane, mm. who's injured. How much pressure would that put on him? Immediate pressure. I mean, there's no bedding in. He has to come in and do the job straight away. I um, mean, Harry Kane, they've lost their talisman, 17 goals this season. Um, they've got other players in there that do a job as well. Son, 10 goals. Uh, Lucas Moura was scoring, Deli Ali scoring, but they need someone that can come in and get the job done straight away. What Spurs will be hoping to do is get this across the line immediately. They don't want to wait until the end of the transfer window. They need him and they need him now. They've got important games coming up. Watford look better under Nigel Pearson coming up. City coming up as well. So there's a lot of pressure for him to come in and score. You mentioned, obviously, the good season last season. 30 goals, Genoa and AC Milan. Not so good this season, but that's also because AC Milan have changed managers as well. And the second season, a little dip as well. So I expect him to come in, get the goals, and Tottenham need him to get the goals straight away. Yeah, we have got some stats, actually, Andrew, which you can talk over these stats because it backs up what you were saying about this season. We'll bring them up for you because it's, it's, it's 18 games, 14 of those are starts, and just the four Yeah, goals. It's, it's the minutes per goal that I think will probably worry Tottenham fans because it seems like he's actually lost form. And it's interesting. You think about the last Milan striker to come to the Premier League, Patrick Atroni. When he came in the summer, he went through exactly the same spell. Fantastic first season, second season stopped scoring. Scoring, then got to move to the Premier League, didn't work. So Tottenham fans will be desperately hoping that isn't the case here, signing an out-of-form striker from a team dipping in form themselves. Right. But saying that, my, I think the interesting thing for me about this is Tottenham, more and more often you see them in the transfer window over-negotiate and then wait for deals to get done. And as Addy says, they need to get a player in right now. They are outside the top four and they, they cannot afford to lose much more ground. No, so right. they need to get this deal done now. They'll have their ambitions, especially Champions League football for next season, especially will be an ambition. Now, this is going to be a huge, huge problem in terms of those personal ambitions for Spurs. But at the same time, I do like the fact that they do have maybe a little bit more depth than they think. I mean, Son, yeah. 10 goals this year. We've seen him play in the forward line beforehand and, and work out well. I mean, Deli Ali as well has yeah. come into good form recently under Jose Mourinho. Lucas Moura has done a job up front as well. So even though we've spoken beforehand about can they address those depth problems if Harry Kane does get injured, 
maybe they do have some options that we are maybe considering usually that we were considering. Yeah, maybe playing a, a player slightly out of position, which, which can still work. All right, let's move on to, to Christian Eriksen because Inter Milan still want him. Michael, what's the latest? Yeah, I mean, Inter are continuing their attempts to sign him in the coming weeks, but no agreement has been reached. Um, tough one, really, with Eriksen because Jose Mourinho still continues to use him. He started in the last three games. A number of fans think he's, he's kind of got eyes elsewhere now. But you look at most stats and he's the top of assists and everything still after the last few years. I think Jose Mourinho will think, OK, Tottenham Hotspur could get 19, 20, 21 million from him now. But he won't don't really, I don't think that would really bother him. He wants to keep, he would want to keep him until the summer because he can't lose many more players. We've got, Spurs have got so many games mm -hmm. to come. And Ade, with the injuries that we've been talking about in midfield, surely yeah. Mourinho will be desperate to keep Ericsson now, even if it is just till the end of the season. Yeah, you've got to have that conversation with Ericsson. You've got to sit down with him and say, look, end of the season, you can go. But for now, we need to get into the Champions League. They're only six points off top four. They're still into the last 16. They've got a favourable draw in the last 16 of the Champions League against Leipzig. So they'll look and think they can progress against them. So it, they need to keep him. Lo Celso has not really done it. Uh, Sissoko's now injured as well. He is their most creative player. You look at how many chances he's created since the Premier League, since he began in the Premier League, and only David Silva's better than him. That shows how important he can be. And if we're talking about Piontek coming in now as well, they need to create chances for him, and he's the best player to do that as well. So they need to keep him. If they can convince Christian Eriksen to, to stay, it probably would personally be best for him as well, because the options then would open up for the Premier League clubs if he decided he wanted to stay in England. In terms of options, he wouldn't just have the non-European clubs. Oh, sorry, the European clubs as an option. He would also have <coughs> Premier League clubs that can entertain and, and could offer him contracts. And he would completely be a free agent then. There wouldn't be any sort of option for anywhere else. Everything that he's going to get, he would maximise upon by dealing in the summer rather than dealing with now. I think Eriksen quite surprised himself that no move has materialised yet. Um, nothing really was concrete in the summer. That's where I think the surprise is. And with Inter, I, I, I did have slight raised eyebrows. I thought, oh, it, if, if that's where he is going to end up, because I think he had more ambitions in the summer of, of a Real Madrid. Yeah. But we can debate all day long if he's Real Madrid standard. But I was slightly surprised when I saw Inter Milan, from Antonio Conte's point of view, he's getting a fantastic player for a nominal fee. If it Do you think his stock's time. gone down? Because, again, you talked about Real Madrid. PSG also sort of earmarked as a possible destination as well. It, it's tough. I'm really torn and Spurs fans are torn as well. Some, some are really frustrated. Wrong person to ask, Well, you? no, because I, I look at Ericsson and think he's still, for me, and I'm going to get so much Twitter abuse in a minute, but he's still the one player I look to to score that goal 89 minutes. Out of nowhere, he'll, he'll score. Like Bryson special, last season. special talent. Yeah. There was no uh, about and I, and I must say, if he, if he wants a move, then that's fine. But it's a bit of the Aaron Ramsey situation last year when he was leaving, but he showed a fantastic attitude. Mm. Anton, let's look at it from the other side because we haven't looked at the Inter Milan's yeah. reason here. What's their transfer policy? How does this fit in? Well, for starters, Inter Milan are feeling themselves right now. They're top of Serie A at the moment, which is, which is fantastic. This is where they've wanted to be for a long time. Antonio Conte, I kind of argue, other than Leipzig, they're probably the most exciting prospect in Europe, out of, the, out of the sort of big European teams right now. So they, were, they are an, an attractive proposition for players to go to. Milan are looking to, 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 Inter Milan are looking to make a big signing in January, either Arturo Vidal or Christian Eriksen to come in and improve that, that creativity in the midfield. They're also looking at Franck Cassier from rivals AC Milan as well. So they're looking to make a splash in January. They could do a lot worse than Christian Eriksen, oh, can't they? No doubt. Absolutely. Well, let's go on to Manchester United then, because Ole Gunnar Solskjaer was asked this morning about reports in Portugal that he and Mike Phelan went to watch sporting midfielder Bruno Fernandes. This is what the Manchester United manager had to say. We go back to uh, speculations and we do go and watch games all the time, but where I've been and when I've been uh, somewhere, it's uh, uh, irrelevant and that's another player that's in a different uh, club and I can't speak about. So, yeah, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, that as quite often happens in a, in a news conference, he, he, he can neither confirm nor deny their interest in Bruno <laughs> Fernandes. Um, but he has been out scouting out there in Portugal anyway. Now, this is quite interesting, all right? Let me just explain this to you all, all right? A bit to take in here. O Jogo, which is a newspaper out in Portugal, they're saying this, right? The 70 million euros, which, Anton, how many? It's about 59.4 million. Oh, okay, uh, roughly. That roughly 59.4 like roughly 59. <laughs> million pounds. All right. So, so listen. Listen so to this. Bank account. Right. Well, that would that would be uh, acceptable for Sporting Lisbon to sell him. Right. Now that same newspaper, O Jogo, which is which is um, a respected newspaper out there, say that uh, in the summer the offer from Tottenham for him 
added up to 70 million euros, all right, but it was 45 million euros up front, the other 25 million to make it 70, that was deemed by Sporting Lisbon to be unrealistic. Right, however, since then, Sporting Lisbon have found themselves in a few financial difficulties. They still want 70 million pound, uh, euros, sorry, overall, but would accept a little bit more in instalments, so maybe the down payment wouldn't be quite so high. All right, now, if that's true, from what Ojogo is saying, that would be a U-turn from Manchester United if they're interested, because in the summer we were told categorically that he was not a target. Of course, injuries means that that need for a central midfielder for Manchester United has intensified. McTominay is out. Paul Pogba's been out for, for a while. Well, he came back, then got injured again. So, uh, a U-turn for Manchester United, if what Ojogo is saying is true. But also, Anton, what would that suggest to you that Sporting Lisbon are willing to sort, in a way, lower the price? Yeah, well, effectively, what they've done, and also he signed a new contract a couple of months ago, Bruno Fernandes, which has given... Uh, sporting a lot more freedom to sign him for a price that they want to sell him at before they were tied in with the minimum release fee and then having to pay him five million euros every time they rejected a bid over a certain amount it was very complicated <laughs> anyway um but for me this this strikes and it's something that manchester united haven't been particularly good at as being financially ruthless here they've got a target they've got a player they want and now they can sniff they can get him for a price they couldn't get him in the summer Go and do the business. They had to overpay, overpay for Harry Maguire because everyone knows they, you know, he was their top target and Manchester United have got money. Now they're dealing with a club that wants to sell. So United are now, you know, they're like a shark sniffing blood in the water. Like, right, bang, go and attack. Go and get it. Go and get it right now. Oh, Anton, how I've missed you, man. Yeah. That, that analysis right there is absolutely perfect because Man United, how long have we been talking about missing that creative spark in the middle of the midfield? Yeah. Add that to the injury depletions they have within their squad right now. You're talking about a player that's not just done it for one season. Last year had a fantastic, fantastic season. Attracted so much interest across the whole of Europe. What, 20 goals, 13 assists. He's done it again this year. Even so far at the halfway stage of this year, six goals, seven assists, he's emulating that form and showing consistency with it. Now, that spark, that creative player are the type of players that you need in your team. They're the type of players that can do things when everything isn't working at Old Trafford. That is the type of player that can change a game instantly. Yeah, we do want to hear from Manchester United fans, by the way, because we're talking about you for the next few minutes. Hashtag transfer talk uh, on, at Sky Sports News. Michael, we, we heard Ole, Sol Ole Gunnar Solskjaer playing things down, which happens in every news conference, it would appear. All right, just for the viewers at home who don't know, as journalists who, who go to these news conferences, why does that happen? Just to explain it. Well, every, every manager's different, which makes it so entertaining when we get the opportunity <laughs> to, to judge the press conferences Thursdays or, or Fridays. But managers do this as well. They play it a lot down as well because of the simple thing as well. When they finish the press conference, they're going to go out and see their players, their current players. Oh, oh, you want a new right back, do you? Oh, you want a new striker, do you? It's not always beneficial to openly tell uh, the public what you're going for. I'm, I want this, I want that. It does work on occasions, and your ears certainly prick when you're in the, the press conference, but, but managers do play the cards close to their chest, and you, know, you take every word of what they say is gospel, but however, you, we, know, we know the situation, and also we know they have a squad they have to work with and they don't want to upset. Yeah, all right, a few, a few tweets coming in. I'll just read this one out. Um... Um, from Ollie there, who says, I'm a Manchester United fan, I feel that we need to sign... He's quite ambitious, this guy. He says we need to sign Fernandez, yeah. Van der Beek, Zayic, maybe Partry, uh, Chan or Kessier, mm. if Van der Beek doesn't want to sign. Then we also need to sign well, Mukiele yeah. and Klosterman <laughs> as defensive options. Wow, nice. And we can't, can't, sign, <laughs> we can't <laughs> sign no players in this window, all right? So Ollie very much hoping that his club are going to be um, are going to be active in this transfer window, just like Michael Bridges' head is active in my camera shot. OK, right, I tell you what, we told you yesterday that Ashley Young has rejected a contract extension from Manchester United. Solskjaer has also responded to speculation that Young is unhappy about having a move to Inter Milan blocked. This is our captain. Uh, there's lots of speculations and we've just got to handle that. that we're getting used to that in this club. And Ashley's been... Uh, very professional and focused, so I uh, don't think that's gonna gonna change. I know you say you've got to handle that, but is he gonna be a Manchester United player after January, or is he gonna go to Inter Milan now? Well, that's a discussion that the, me and Ash will have if something uh, comes up, and uh, for us, we have we haven't uh, got too many players uh, uh, fit and ready, so uh, we need the ones we have. 
Yeah, chat Ashley Young in a moment. Just just quickly, a few tweets have come in uh, about Bruno Fernandes. Uh, Matty, uh, Matty says, Manchester United need to go for players and sort the team out. Uh, Fernandes would be a great signing. Uh, Eel says uh, that Manchester United are all huff and puff to appease the fans. There'll be no arrivals. And someone called Ole99 says, get Bruno Fernandes in, please. Woodward, just do it. OK, on this Ashley Young situation, mm -hmm. uh, JD, we just heard Ole Gunnar Solskjaer on it there. If Ashley Young is unhappy that he's not allowed to move to Inter Milan this month. Can you understand that? I can understand it from Ashley Young's perspective. I mean, I think he was very honest in terms of and talking about he would be in that squad and he'd understand the philosophy of bringing those young players through. They've got Juan Bissaka, they've got Delot there as well in the right back position, and the left back. They've got um, New Brandon that's come through as well. You've got Luke Shaw who's sitting there in that, in that team. So he would assess it and think to stuff. I've got four young fullbacks here who are going to want to push on this with their careers at Man United. Oli Gunnar Solskjaer spoke about bringing those young players through as well. Where do I fit in? I want minutes, I'm still 34, I still want to achieve stuff within my own personal career. Where do I fit into that system? Now, I can understand it from the Man United perspective as well. You don't really want to lose too many leaders and captains from your changing room. So it, it's a kind of a pull and pull sort of situation. But he's got to have his own personal ambitions at heart. And he's going to want a big club like Inter Milan are asking you to come and play for their team. It's a great opportunity. Yeah, Man Manchester United are huge as well, are they? And, and if uh, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is the manager, if yeah. he says, I don't want Ashley Young to go this window, surely the board have to back Solskjaer's decision rather than let Young go. They do, but I think they also have to respect Young as well. He's been there, he's been a good servant for them for, what, nine seasons now. And you just reeled off the, the right-back and left-back. He, he's literally he's third choice on both sides now. That's unfortunate. So this guy's going to come in only when what players are suspended or rested or someone needs minutes. I think Inter Milan's a good move for him. It's an 18-month contract. United, if they want to keep him, match that contract. Give him an 18-month as well. They're only going to give him a year, and that's the problem. He's got a chance of going to Italy, winning the league there as well. It's important for him to go. But why? Why, do you, why should United give him a new contract? That's what I don't understand. United need to be ruthless. Why keep a guy that's going to be a third-choice player and then offer him another year? United have dallied around in, the trans, in the, their contracts previously and they've been caught out with players on two bigger wages and two longer contracts. The, He's not the future. His, his wage so, is going to be so a problem. So make the decision and either get rid of him now or just get rid of him after six months. But effectively, United need to look at what's best for them. But they've, sp they've spoken so much about leadership within that changing room. You cannot afford to lose another captain. Another captain. Right, look. Loads of other stories going on right now. Let's get through some of them now with State of Play with Michael. Thank you very much, Tom. Yes, West Ham are interested in signing Marouane Fellaini as manager David Moyes looks to team up with the midfielder at a third different club. Patrick Catroni is in Florence to complete his move from Wolves to Fiorentina. And Mikel Arteta says he has convinced Granit Xhaka to change his mind about his future at Arsenal. Wolves and Brighton have joined a number of top European clubs in the hunt for RB Leipzig's Brazilian striker Mateus Cunha. And this is a transfer we like here. Celtic winger Lewis Morgan has been given permission to speak to Inter Miami and complete a move to David Beckham's franchise club in the MLS. Plenty still to come this lunchtime. We'll be speaking to one of Aberdeen's new signings and we'll hear from the Liverpool boss, Jurgen Klopp.
Fox and breaking news. It just happened in the break, actually, and again, it involves Inter Milan. It also involves Olivier Giroud. OK, because Inter Milan officials have held talks with Giroud's agents and they've agreed terms for a January transfer. That's according to Sky in Italy. All right. Now, his deal at Chelsea expires at the end of the season, as we've been saying. Now, we're told that he's actually agreed a two and a half year contract at Inter Milan. Right. However, and this is crucial, Inter haven't yet agreed a deal with Chelsea and Chelsea are asking between uh, £6.8 million pounds and £8.5 million. Pounds. If you think that's precise, it's because originally it's in euros, between 8 and €10 million. Euros. So Chelsea are wanting a fee, even though he's only got six months left on his contract. However, Inter Milan don't want to spend more than €5 million, euros, which is about £4.3 million. Pounds. And Giroud does have other offers on the table, including from Lyon, but... He is, we're told, keen to move to Inter, so much so that he's agreed personal terms with them. It's just that they haven't agreed Inter uh, a deal with Chelsea for a fee. We can also tell you that, well, we told you earlier this week that Aston Villa had made an approach for Giroud earlier this month, uh, but instead they opted for Danny Drinkwater on loan from Chelsea instead. So Olivier Giroud's agents have agreed terms in a move, well, for a move to Inter Milan in January, but no fee is agreed as yet. The Scottish Premiership and Celtic, Rangers and Aberdeen are all out in Dubai at the moment uh, during their winter break. There's been plenty of transfer activity, though. Aberdeen completed one deal just the other day in Dylan McGeoch from Sunderland. We can hear from the new signing now, who's with Charles Patterson. Well, the start of the Scottish transfer window has been quite quiet, but Aberdeen have made the first major move signing Dylan McGeoch from Sunderland. And he joins us here in Dubai with the Aberdeen training squad. Uh, great to see you here out out here with the new team how how do you feel being out here in the what was heat until today and being part of your new squad yeah i think it's great um to get it done early mm. um i've not trained much the last few weeks so it's good to get a good um, week's training here and obviously come out and we thought we'd get a bit of sun but it's um <laughs> not to be today but hopefully it picks up and as i said it's good to get a few few days training with the, with the new team why was aberdeen the, the club for you um, Derek, to be fair, before I moved down south, was always keen to get me in. Um, it's a great club, um, and obviously the opportunity uh, came, came along to kind of leave Sunderland. Derek was back on the phone and stuff, and I think just the fact that he was really keen to get me in, and hopefully we can um, be successful at this club together. He, he obviously identifies you as someone who could make an immediate impact. Um, wh what do you think that you can bring to this Aberdeen team, and what do you see in this Aberdeen team that gives you hope? Um, obviously, I want to make a, a good impact for them to start. Um, obviously, build fitness up this week and see where we are beginning the next week. So, um, obviously, it's a great team. They've been up there the last few years. Um, very strong, very young, good experience as well. So, hopefully, I can, can bring something to that team as well and add to that. The old firm, of course, are, are so strong this season. What do you think Aberdeen can achieve this year? Obviously, um, they're, they're both strong, as you mm. said. Um, League-wise, I think we can finish as high up as possible. Um, would be an achievement and obviously a, a cup as well a good cup run and hopefully bring home a cup as well I think obviously they've been close to it the last few years so if we can manage to bring one home then it'd be a great season for us And they've got the new training ground at Aberdeen of course and there's investment coming in with the, 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 from Atlanta, it's quite an exciting time to be joining the club isn't it? Yeah it's great, um, obviously everyone's raving about the new training ground and it makes such a difference to the players and staff all will be under one roof um, and I've had a look about quickly the other day and it's, it's excellent so it's things all in the up um, for the club and it's looking positive. How much are your potential Scotland ambitions a factor in this decision as well? To be honest I didn't really think too much about it um, obviously I had a great time up here um, playing regularly with Hibs and I managed to get, uh, get in the squads and kind of didn't work out down south but I think I just need to get back to playing regularly um, at club football and um, if the international thing comes up again then I'd be delighted but I'm just concentrating and doing well for Aberdeen just now. You are in your prime years I guess, do you still feel you have your best years as a footballer ahead of you? Yeah I hope so, um, obviously as I said I had a good few years up here and I really enjoyed it and um, it was excellent, I won a few things as well so it was great, um, so obviously as I said it didn't really work out down the road but I think if I can kick up my career again and I've got a good few years ahead of me yeah. Dylan, great to see you. Have a good week when you're out here. Thank you very much indeed. There you go. Dylan McGeoch, Aberdeen's new signing. Potentially one or two more for Aberdeen this month. Uh, they will be playing a, a match out here on Monday before they head back to Scotland ahead of their Scottish Cup tie against Dumbarton next weekend.
<laughs> Thanks, Charles. Good to hear from Dylan McGeoch there. I'm sure he'll be a success at Aberdeen. Right, now it's time for Stay or Go. Get ready. Can you oh, you I can do it. I can do it. I never thought that, Anton. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you need a hand, oh, well, I don't well, mean like that. If you need some help, <laughs> it's all right. please let us know. Right, we're going to be talking about Max Aaron. So get ready for this. Borussia Dortmund have joined a list of clubs who are keen to sign the Norwich right back. <laughs> Max Aaron, he's 19 years old. Growing list of admirers includes Tottenham, Arsenal, Everton and West Ham, as well as Bundesliga leaders RB Leipzig. So, Max Aaron's in this window. Transfer team, should he stay or go? Ah, oh, I feel bad. No, <laughs> Have you changed? Yeah, because okay. it was a it was a biased thing, but no. All right, then. Oh, I know why. I <laughs> yeah, know why. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, oh, JD, why should he? Why should Max Aaron stay um, at Norwich? I love his ability at his age. I think 19, 20 years old. You, 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 in terms of as a fullback, that is the, probably one of the most exciting fullbacks in the league. He wants to get forward. He wants to drive. He wants to do things in the final third. He wants to impact the game. I mean, you talked about the, the list of suitors, the Dortmunds. You're talking about the Arsenal's, Tottenham's, West Ham's. Everybody has been linked to him. He probably has a list of suitors probably from here. To to, to the back of the room, but it's not about that at this stage of his career. He's 20 years old, 19, like you're still developing as a man, you're still developing, and minutes are the most important thing. And I think him playing in the Premier League, the experience that he would have with Norwich this year, is going to be vital for him in terms of his longevity of his career. And if but. he wants to turn around and say, I'm going to play but. in England, he's got Reese James, he's got Wamba Saka, he's got Trent Alexander Arnold, who's arguably the best player under 21 right now. Yeah. Trippy and Walker, As, don't forget them. I'm just like, it's but, long days, so development is important. Sounds good, and I, I fully understand what you're saying, and it, it does sound good. Look, if it was a situation <laughs> where Norwich weren't in a precarious situation they're in, like they're seven points off what Aston Villa right now, so. Look, Norwich probably might go down. I don't want them to. I like the club. I like what they're doing there, but they probably will. So it's a situation where I don't think the grass is always greener, but in terms of his progression, I think he needs to stay in the Premier League, and I don't think Norwich are going to be in the Premier League coming into the season. What are you going to learn by getting beaten every week? You just mentioned about how fantastic he was going forward, and he's not really getting that chance because Norwich are on the back foot. So, and, and if, he goes, to, if he goes to Tottenham, if he goes to Arsenal, he will play. Both of those teams need fullbacks right now. So, for me, it's, I kind of agree. Usually I'd say stay, continue the development. No, go. You, you are, you're hot right now. Take, teams want you. Take advantage of that. He's if 19. Norwich, if not, He's 19. If Norwich were mid-table, would you tell him to go? If Norwich were mid-table? No, OK, let me put it this way. It's that is a, bit, that is a big difference, experience. though, are they, in fairness? It's that. Premier League experience. And you're talking about in this window right here, he's going to learn a lot just playing in the Premier League. How old's Trent Alexander-Arnold? That doesn't count. He's a very special case. Right, anyway. Order. Okay. Order. Right, that's, that's stay or go for today, right? Man, you can download the latest Premier League <laughs> podcast right now. We're doing one straight after this, actually. It's available on iTunes, Spreaker and the Sky Sports website. Next, more reactions to the news that we told you that Inter Milan are holding talks with Olivier Giroud's representatives.
Welcome back to Transfer Talk. And it's a big January for Wolverhampton Wanderers. That's the club I'm covering this January for Sky Sports News. Now, their head coach, Nuno Espirito Santo, says he wants new players, but no one has signed for the club yet. So, number one, their top priority, increase the number of players in the squad. Because Wolves, well, they've played a whopping 38 games this season so far. And their two biggest summer signings in Patrick Catroni and Jesus Vallejo, well, they've pretty much left. So a long, long season will be hard on the legs unless reinforcements are found. Number two, Wolves, get a striker. Raul Jimenez is integral to the success of Wolves going forward. But what happens if he needs a rest or gets a knock? Patrick Catroni is currently having a medical at Fiorentina right now, and Diogo Schotta and Adama Traore aren't number nines. The club wants to sign Juan Key Chan from RB Salzburg, but they don't want to sell, having already lost Haaland and Minamoto this January. And number three, keep your stars, Wolverhampton Wanderers. Jimenez has already been linked with Manchester United. Adama Traore, who is an absolute star this season, is turning heads all over Europe. Champions League clubs are sniffing around, but Europe's biggest cup competition is the promised land for Wolves. They're only six points off the top four, and winning the Europa League could also get them there too. So, in Traore, they trust at Wolves, and rightly so. OK, yeah. Anton mentioned there that Wolves are only six points off the top four. JD, what do they have to do in this window to get themselves into those Champions League places? There's still 17 games in the league to go. They need a lot of hope, a lot of prayer and a lot of investment. But um, let's be real, the, the hope and the prayer is one side, but the investment, is that going to really happen in this window? On to, the, to, the, to the lengths and to the extremes that Wolves actually need it to get to the top four, because it would be basically a miracle they would need. And I understand what you're saying in terms of the gap points-wise, but you're not taking one other aspect into it. It's the f how many game games have they played so far already? 36 games. 38. Thank you very much. 38 Welcome. games, you're even adding to my that. point. So I'm telling you, the continuity in terms of their squad selection is fantastic. The way that those players understand their roles is fantastic. The tactical nous of Nuno Santo that he's expressed this year has been brilliant. But at the same time, how many games have you played? And that fatigue will catch up with you, especially in the latter part of the season. All right. Well, six points isn't a miracle, is it? Is it surely? But, but, but Wolves' recent history... Uh, you know, isn't like, you know, winning trophies yeah. or anything like that, all right? So does that make it more difficult for them to persuade players of the next level to take them to the next level to come to the club? When we say next level, they're in the Europa League already. So we're talking Champions League. We, we, yeah, we're talking Champions League, definitely. It, it's going to be difficult. I think the problem they're going to have, and I know JD's going to disagree with me in this one, but the problem they're going to have is to convince the Champions League calibre players they've got to stay. I mean, Jimenez, we know that teams are looking at him, Traore as well, Connor Cody good centre-back. So, I think the problem for them is keeping those players. Um, look, I, I like Wolves. I think they had a good season so far. Do I think they're going to make Champions League? No. Do I think they can attract Champions League-type players? No. Because I think they're going to struggle to keep the Champions League-type players they've got. OK, well, on that then, Michael, how, how realistic is it that they do keep Adama Traore and Raul Jimenez? Not in this window, but long term. This is remarkable. Let's step back a bit. We're talking about a side that was promoted last... They are a promoted side last season in the Europa League last 32 looking to get into the Champions League. Fantastic stuff. Absolutely yeah. phenomenal. Nuno Espirito Santo, and until he leaves, they will think like a top club. He's a top, top manager, a serious manager. You're already signing him off. You say, until he leaves. Until, well, <laughs> well, well, <laughs> well, well, he's talking about. Well, he's not, well, nothing's yeah, forever. He's been, he's been no one's, nothing's yeah. forever. Nothing's forever yeah. because, you know, Whenever a massive job comes in, the likes of Nuno get, gets, yeah. gets put in that bracket for good reason. He's done a phenomenal job at Molyneux. I just have to say, to attract Champions League quality players, they have Champions League quality players there already. Yeah. So mm. quality players want to play with quality players. So like Adama Traore, Jao Moutinho, Real Jimenez. Ruben Neves, remember? Those players across Europe, do you not think they understand and look at those players and say, I would love to play in no, that no, system I with those players? I fully agree with that point. My point is, can they keep those? If they can keep those players, which we'll, we'll see next season, then, yeah, add into that, I think they can. But I think they're going to struggle to keep all the, that nucleus, those four. I think they'll struggle to keep them next well, season. What, what, what I think we they've bought into the system, though. I think they've bought into the project. Yeah. I think they genuinely love playing for this manager, love playing at this club, love playing in that direction. Yeah. So why couldn't they attract Troy has even come out this already, I think, when he's gone back home and said that like, he would like to go back to Spain and play football there. He's spoken about going back to Barcelona again and retrying that. So, look, if they can keep that nucleus, fine. If they can't, they'll have a problem. Right, OK, let's just recap on, on some news we brought you earlier on about Olivier Giroud and Inter Milan officials have held talks with Giroud's agents. They have agreed terms for a January transfer. Sky in Italy are reporting that, all right? So, Giroud, his contract expires at the end of this season at Chelsea. He's been offered 
at Inter Milan. Uh, Sky in Italy are saying a two and a half year deal to sign for them now. However, and this is the most crucial part, Inter haven't agreed a fee with Chelsea yet. And Chelsea want between six and a half million pounds and eight and a half million pounds for him uh, with six months left on his contract. But Inter <coughs> don't want to spend more than about four and a half million pounds. Giroud also has other offers on the table, including from Lyon, right? But he is keen on a move. Uh, to Inter Milan. So, uh, Anton, Giroud is a man in demand and you can see why. Yeah, I can. I just don't think Inter Milan is the most logical move for Olivier Giroud right now because Inter Milan have got two of the hottest strikers and one of the best partnerships in Europe right now in Lautaro Martinez and Romelu Lukaku yeah. up front. And Giroud's got one last big move where he can prove he's a star. He's the number nine. He's the guy. Throughout his, I feel like throughout his entire career, in England, certainly in England, we've been questioning right. whether he's the guy who should always be leading the line at a top club. This is the one chance he gets to move and he's going to go and play backup at another club. It doesn't make any sense to me. For me, Olivier Giroud has nothing to prove to anyone. He's won pretty much everything. I'd he's like won the to... World Cup. Exactly. Yeah. Well, there you go. Done. See you later. But no, he's, he's, won, he's won pretty much everything. <laughs> What's the challenge? He, doesn't, he wants to be the number one striker. Could he get that at Aston Villa? Yes. Could he get that in Newcastle? Yes. Could he get that at Crystal Palace? There's a theme here. Yes! Okay. So, you know, okay. if, if, if he stays in England, you, they already know you've got a top striker there. So I'd, I'd probably like to see him stay in the Premier League. But then you, all of those clubs you just mentioned, how many of those are in the Champions League? Does he want to play in how the many Champions those League? Are in the, how many of those are in European competitions? Does he want that? I, but I'm sure, he, I'm, sure, I'm sure he doesn't sure want, want that. that. I mean, he would yeah. want that, but I, I see your point. Yeah. He's going to play more if it's a club that it's aren't. Ultimately, to Giroud, does he want to stay in the Premier League? He, he, you know, he, he loves England. But yeah, if he wants to be in Europe, then he probably would have to look elsewhere. You think about it, at the beginning of the season, Oliver Giroud's mentality would have been, I was starting for Chelsea. I mean, I understand the form that Tammy yeah. Abraham has taken, yeah. but I was starting. I was a number nine going into this season. So why would all of a sudden, just because it's now January, would I turn around and change my perspective? He was a number nine of a team that was in the Champions League. Yeah. I'm so, fair play to Tammy Abraham. I hold my hand up. I didn't see how well, he didn't envisage how well he'd do. He, he just needs to play. The Euros are coming up next summer. He needs to get into that French squad. And right now, he's out of that French squad. He needs to, he needs to play. And right now, he's not playing. He needs to go to a team that he is guaranteed to start. And like you say, Inter Milan isn't that team is guaranteed to start. He's guaranteed to start at Aston Villa, mm. Newcastle and Crystal Palace. He needs to make those moves. Yeah, yeah so th th three of you in, in agreement that, um, that he, he should stay in the Premier League and, and be the number one striker. I've got a developing story here to tell you about here. It involves West Ham. It's just come into us this right now, OK? West Ham have made a bid for Inter Milan striker, so more Inter Milan, mm -hmm. Gabriel Barbosa, who they call Gabby Goal, yeah. by the way. <laughs> However, all right, the reason this isn't breaking news is because the bid actually went in before Christmas. Since then, West Ham have prioritised other areas on the pitch. The deal is now off, all right? So West Ham fans, I know a lot of you have tweeted in about Gabriel Barbosa. That deal is now off, but uh, Barbosa is thought to be considering options in England and around Europe as well. He's been on loan at Flamenco. He scored twice to help them win the Copa Libertadores final. His flown at Flamenco ended last month. The Brazilian club are keen to sign him permanently. He looks like he's got no future at Inter Milan. He could well have a future in the Premier League, but it won't for now be at West Ham because they did go in for him. It was before Christmas. That is now off the table, that deal. Right, on the way, we'll look at the key players in the treatment room and how much of an impact that may have on clubs' transfer plans.
Oh, I wonder why I've been asked to do this segment. Right, now we all know things can go awry over Christmas. People get hurt doing everyday things like yoga. And footballers are no different. But when they get hurt, transfer plans are affected. No club likes to spend big in January, but now some will simply have to. The best example of this, of course, is Tottenham. We spent the last 24 hours debating what they should do now Harry Kane's out until April. The replacement in Christophe Piontek will cost, well, potentially up to £30 million. Musa Sissoko, Hugo Lloris injuries have seen fans ask for improvements in goal and midfield too this month. Talking of midfield, Manchester United probably didn't want to buy two midfielders this window. They may well have to now with Scott McTominay and this man Paul Pogba on the sidelines as well. We all know Aston Villa spent more than £130 million in the summer and they thought they were well stocked in goal, but injuries to Tom Heaton and Jed Steer are seeing them having to act this month. Pepe Reina may well come in, but who would have predicted that in the summer? Also, no Wesley means a striker is also a priority. Will Villa's overall spending for the season top £150 million? And what about Bournemouth? They've slumped into the relegation places and have a long injury list. How much better would they be doing with the likes of David Brook, Joshua King and Arno Janjuma back? But does the club roll the dice, get new players in now, or do they wait for their injured stars to come back? A lot is riding on them making the right decision. Yeah, Anton, come back over to the desk uh, as, as carefully as you can. Uh, a lot of people have been uh, tweeting hashtag transfer talk, and one of them actually says... Are you sure JD didn't damage Anton? They seem to be very aggressive towards each other. <laughs> well, if, if, you, if, 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 if you were watching over the summer, you would see this is the tip of the iceberg. There was a lot more clashes between those two. I'm just to happy come. you're healthy, mate. Don't worry. <laughs> oh, what? I'm just happy you're healthy, mate. Ish. 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 New energy. <laughs> right, okay, in, term, in terms of these injuries, all right, Ade, clubs do have big squads, all right? They're allowed to name 25 players and as many youngsters as they want if they're under 21. But when some of those injury lists that Anton are talking about are so big, it can still have a big impact and, and force you to, to go into the market in January. Yeah, especially if you didn't have plans to go into the market. I mean, you didn't mention Newcastle there. Newcastle, 12 injuries. Mm. I mean, they're having to force to go into the market and they don't really want to. The problem is, when you go into the market and those players get fit, then you've got two bigger squads. So um, it's a difficult situation for a lot of these clubs. Bournemouth have to go into the market just because of where they are. So you, it's all about where they are in terms of sort of league position. If you're mid-table, relatively safe, maybe not challenging for Europe, you can play it safe. If you're pushing for European positions or in a relegation battle, your hands are tied, you've got to go into that market and then force, to, I don't know, to kind of work with that bigger squad when they all come back fit. It kind of bring a problem though, Anthony. You kind of suggest it there with Aston Villa. If you've spent your whole season's budget in the summer and you get injuries, you, you can be restricted because of financial fair play or just the, the owner's yeah. purse strings and you might have to go for loans only. Well, we just heard from West Ham, you know, originally going into the window, they wanted a striker and now they're going, oh, our priorities have changed and they, they're probably looking to sign a, a holding midfielder because obviously they've started struggling. So it's a case that, you know, you can, clubs have long-term strategies and now all of a sudden they're in scramble mode, they're in panic mode. Look at Tottenham, you know, and but the thing is, I mean, you know, I've, I've, Michael's been chewing my ear off for a long time because... They, 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 they probably should have signed a striker in the summer. They should have provided a backup, but nobody wants to back up Harry Kane. Now, now they have to go and find someone and probably overpaid to do so. The key, the key with Tottenham, and like I said it on the show earlier, is that selling Vincent Janssen, that's fine. He needed a fresh challenge. Fernando Llorente, Llorente, fine. But you have to replace these players because they're looking short now and there's so many games to come. Yeah. All right. Trade to some uh, Premier League managers now have been coming in all day. It's a story we've been across, so we broke it on Tuesday, actually, involving Adamola Luckman. We told you uh, that Newcastle had inquired about a loan with a view to a permanent transfer of the RB Leipzig winger, and Steve Bruce today confirmed this story to our reporter, Keith Downey. Can I put one name to you just because he's been doing the rounds the last couple of days? Um, Luckman, Adamola Luckman at Leipzig. Is there an interest there? Well, look, I think Keith, I've, I've been linked with uh, 38 players that Lee has run past me, the, our media man, and he's another one of them. He's a good player, I like him, well, who wouldn't do, but uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit far off at the moment. Yeah, a bit far off at the moment is what Steve Bruce is saying about Adam Ola Luckman, but we know, uh, well, he's just confirming to Keith, who's part of our transfer team, that they are interested in signing. Let's get to Bournemouth now. Could it be a busy month for them? Here are the thoughts of their manager, Eddie Howe, on transfers. Have there been any approaches, any bids? No, no bids for any of our players. Nothing at all, no, no, no. interest? And, and any indication from any of your players that they're perhaps looking elsewhere at all? I'd certainly hope not, not, not with the position that we're in. You know, it's not a time for that. 
it's a time for everyone to unite together, um, to be totally focused on achieving our goals and our aims. Um, it's a really difficult window. I've said it all along to recruit, but also to sell any of your your top players, the ones that make the difference, the ones that are part of your plans. Absolute no, no, as far as I'm concerned, if we're to achieve our objectives. Absolute no, no from Eddie Howe. Right, Crystal Palace, we know that they are after a striker and they're closing in on one, aren't they, Michael? Yes, um, Crystal Palace close to agreeing a deal with Everton for the loan signing of Senk Tosin. Um, this came about around last Saturday. Um, Tosin wants to get more game time ahead of Euro 2020. He's not getting it, Everton, um, you know, whatever reason there. But Palace need strikers. And it might be Tosin and another one as the weeks go on as well. They always do something for me on deadline day, don't you, Palace? Yeah. But someone will be coming in shortly. Yeah. Actually, something's just Twitter have just tweeted, agreed, and Palace have retweeted it with source. Question mark. So it's worth keeping an eye on the Crystal Palace Twitter account at the moment as well. But I do know What's that. that huh? What do you mean? Uh, I haven't a clue. That's for the Palace Twitter. I don't know. Oh. Um, but yeah, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's. <laughs> Sengtosin is on his way and Palace need goals. They're struggling for goals. Jordan Ayew's actually done brilliant since he's come back um, yeah. from Swansea. Yes. But they need. Uh, Roy Hodgson said he's down to the bare bones when they face Arsenal tomorrow. But um, yeah, it's, it's a one which is mixed Palace supporters. But they were mixed when Gary Cahill joined, and they love him now. He's done great. So if he can start scoring, they won't mind at all. Big if, though, isn't it? I mean, yeah. look at his record for Everton, and it's not been that great. 47 games, 10 goals, only, what, one goal this season. So, yeah, they need strikers. But it just seems like Palace are bringing in bodies rather than someone that can get them goals. Um, I, nothing in sort of Czech Tosin's last two seasons that Everton will suggest to you that he can get the goals to, to keep Palace maybe put higher up the table. Michael was, was saying, Anton, that uh, Roy Hodgson saying they're even struggling to put a team out because their, their squad's quite small and they've got injuries. So, I mean, how much do they need players? Yeah, I mean, I'd argue, you know, they could do with a right back, you know, injuries to Joel Ward, they could do with a left back. You know, and they, I mean, it's interesting, sort of, I Roy spoke to you in the summer, didn't he? And he said, I want defensive reinforcements as well. They never really replaced Aaron Wan-Bissaka. So, this is, but the thing is, Obviously, Palace are having a fantastic season. They're in the, they're in the top half. There is, but the, you, you can look at it, glass half full, glass half empty. They're eight points off the Champions League or they're eight points off the relegation places. <laughs> is it a good season or not? I mean, are they, uh, you know, no, they going to stay in this it's a good trajectory? Uh, it's I, a good season. But you, have to give, you have to give Hodgson credit for the, for the work that he's done so far, especially we're talking about that depletion and then not being able to bring those targets in over the summer. Being, being in the top half, it's fantastic. You're talking about a team that potentially don't have enough first-team players for tomorrow. I've always said, Anton, that if a club like this, I don't think they are in a relegation battle, no. by the way. No, no. And I'd say that this would be a good time to sign players because they're going to get players who wouldn't want to be in, inter in a relegation battle. They're not going to be if they go to Crystal Palace now. Yeah, completely, I completely agree with that. But I also think... The thing with Palace is, how long can you continue to have such a short-term focus on transfers? It's done. Oh, great timing. Listen. Great timing. It's done. Sorry. Oh, nope. yeah. Don't touch my arm. Watch that. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Funny, you've, you've got 15 seconds. Yeah, uh, confirmed, Crystal Palace have signed Senk Tosin on a loan deal. This is literally just drops sec seconds ago. So, yes, Crystal Palace have signed Senk Tosin on loan from Everton until the end of the season. Uh, more on Sky Sports News uh, after the break. But, yeah, it's done. Yeah, well done. End with some breaking news. Anton, thank you, Michael. Thank you, JD. Thank you, Addy. Well done for keeping your um, laptop, laptop fully charged <laughs> today. I'm proud it of you today. for thank it. You OK. Much. Right, that's all for today. But Good Morning Transfers is back on Monday. That is at 9 a.m until 10 a.m. as usual and this show transfer talk back on monday as well midday until 1 p.m we've got joe wilson for both of those shows by the way and tonight you've got dharma chef and carpe solical to return with the transfer show at 7 p.m tonight remember we're off to record a podcast right now will be available tonight coming up on sky sports news though we'll keep you updated uh, and tell you all about that cheng tosin deal and we'll bring you a live news conference with jose Mourinho. massive game for them tomorrow against liverpool <laughs>